I'd like to give you a brief uh, overview of the anatomy of the lumbar spine, which is analogous to the anatomy of the other parts of the spine. The lumbar spine is made of bone and disc, and these uh, two types of tissue protect nerve elements. The anterior portion of this bone, which is extremely large, is called the vertebral body. It is the anterior portion of a tripod of bone that comes back through an area called the pedicle and then comes down into two paired facet joints. This makes up one motion segment where one vertebral body articulates through another one through an intervertebral disc in the front and facet joints in the back. Let's name some of the pieces of bone in the spine so that we can use this later in our discussions. We have different types of spicules of bone called the transverse processes. These are primarily for the origin and insertion of muscles. We have the facet joint going down and a facet joint going up called the facet, uh, superior and inferior facet joints. This area of bone right in here is called the lamina and this is called the spinous process. Muscle fills in this entire area between the lamina and out over the facet joints. And the lamina basically makes up the posterior covering of the spinal canal. The pars interarticularis is a thin area of bone right between the superior articular facet and the inferior articular facet. And this sometimes can become cracked and lead to a condition called spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. The opening where the nerve passes out is called the neural foramen and normally in normal anatomy the disc makes up one wall of the neural foramen, the pedicle and pedicle make up the upper and lower walls of the neural foramen and the facet joint makes up the posterior or back wall of the neural foramen. When our spine is healthy, there's nothing compressing the nerve root. The fluid-filled sac is the extension of the brain and spinal cord coming down. The outer covering of the fluid-filled sac is made of a tissue called the dura, and the fluid inside the fluid-filled sac is called cerebral spinal fluid. Each individual nerve root comes off this fluid sac and comes out and forms a plexus of nerves that then form the sciatic nerve. These are called the nerve roots, and the sciatic nerve is a large peripheral nerve. The disc is made up of two kinds of tissue. It has a very dense outer fibrous tissue, and on the inside, like a jelly-filled donut, there's a softer area of tissue called the nucleus pulposus. If the annulus is intact, the nucleus pulposus cannot come back and compress the nerve. But in a condition called a herniated disc, a ruptured disc, a portion of the nucleus can come out through a tear in the annulus and produce nerve compression. That's called sciatica. People frequently ask me, what is a degenerative disc? I'd like to use some other models to explain that condition. As we've talked about just now, the disc is a nice, tall structure if it's healthy. There's plenty of room for the nerve to come out, and there should be no overriding of the facet joints. What happens in a degenerative disc is that the inner portion of the disc, called the nucleus, becomes dehydrated and it loses water content due to chemical changes that occur inside the disc. When that happens, the disc tends to narrow and become less tall. This is an example of that condition. As you can see, the annulus is bulging outward and the disc is not as tall as in a healthy condition. Now remember we said that the vertebral segment is made up like a tripod. 80% of the forces that come down through the spine occur and transmit themselves through this anterior column of bone, disc, bone. 20% of the axial forces come through the facet joints. If there's a narrowing in the disc, 
the one leg of the tripod is narrower, that has to result in narrowing and overlapping of the facet joints as well. This narrowing of the supporting structures, including the annulus, the disc, and the facet joints, actually can lead to a hypermobility condition. The segment from one vertebra to the other becomes hypermobile. This increased mobility leads to advancing degenerative changes in the facet joints. This is the next example in the cascade where there's been further narrowing and the body senses that hypermobility and it tries to do something to correct it. It forms bone spurs. These are large pieces of bone that are occurring off of the edge of the disc and the ligament complex and these can occur circumferentially around the end plate of the bone and disc junction. When these bone spurs occur in the front, they cause no problems or damage. But if they occur in the back where the nerve comes out, in what we call the neural foramen, the bone spurs take up some of the room where the nerve is supposed to go out, and that causes a narrowing of this opening and it pinches the nerve. In addition to that, just the overriding of the facet joint can lead to a decreased height than the opening where the nerve passes out. The combination of these bone spurs, loss of height, leads to what we call foraminal stenosis and central stenosis. We will frequently see older adults, particularly men, who can't stand up straight. They lean forward when they walk. The reason that they do this is because if they stand up straight, it causes further compromise and narrowing of the nerves. And as a consequence, they will not stand up straight because they can't. The symptoms of spinal stenosis are leg pain, numbness, tingling, and weakness when you stand and walk. When we sit, our spine tends to forward flex. That opens it up. So these people tend to walk leaning forward. They tend to hold on to things like a cane, crutch, or shopping cart. And to get relief from their pain when they stand, they tend to sit or lie down. The final step in the cascade of degeneration can frequently be seen in older people and it's a complete resorption of the disc. All of the nuclear material and annulus have become resorbed and it's basically a condition of bone against bone. It's extremely painful if there's even micromotion and you can see that as the legs of the tripod become further overlapped the opening where the nerve passes through becomes so tight that severe leg pain can occur along with numbness, tingling, and weakness. When it occurs in this opening here, it's called foraminal stenosis. If bone spurs occur off of the lamina, which they will also do, the central opening where the nerve passes through can become compromised or narrowed, and that is called central stenosis. And this is the diagnosis of spinal stenosis and foraminal stenosis. And it's typically occurring in 